Welcome, and thank you for joining us for our 2021 Cultural Vistas Virtual Awards Benefit. My name is Jennifer Clinton, CEO of Cultural Vistas. What a privilege it is to gather from so many parts of the world to celebrate individuals and institutions who embody our mission of developing better leaders for a better future for all. Though we won't be able to break bread together in person today, as we've done in the past, gathering virtually allows us to be more inclusive and bring a much wider representation of our community to the table. We're so glad that you joined us today. Before we get started, I wanna share a few housekeeping items. Uh, we are live streaming on YouTube and the session is being recorded. We will start with our keynote speaker, futurist and best-selling author, Dr. Parag Khanna, who's joining us from Singapore. And you'll have an opportunity to ask questions by utilizing the chat function. We will then present our three awards and have a chance to hear from our corporate awardee, IBM, represented by Carla Grant Pickens, and our amazing alumni awardees, Duane Kualakavi and Cordell Carter, who are doing incredible things in their respective corners of the world. Our program will then conclude with a musical performance, thanks to our cultural sponsor, CF Martin Guitar. I want to extend a special thanks to our financial supporters and partners who make our work possible every day, and especially today. Before we get started, I want to give a little context to where we find ourselves at Cultural Vistas. As we know, in the spring of 2020, as the world came to a complete standstill and totally froze our ability to move people across borders, our board and our staff had a bit of a wake up call. Our historic role of helping people build their careers through international exchange program seemed inadequate for the enormity of the massive shifts and challenges before us. Starting with the pandemic to the global reckoning on racial, racial injustice, to the threats to democratic values around the world, to the massive acceleration of climate change and migration, not to mention the major shifts in the labor market, we recognize that there's so much more that we can be doing to be part of a solution by expanding our focus to not just helping people build their careers, but utilizing our programs to help emerging global leaders link their professional development with social action. So what do I mean by that? And as I said, in addition to helping people access great internships and fellowships and helping them build their networks and advancing their language skills, we as an organization are taking a much more intentional approach across all of our programs to focus on helping our participants develop greater empathy. We know that polarization is crippling our societies both at home and abroad and we're working hard to help people break out of the echo chambers. We're engaging more with our participants and our staff to have hard conversations about inequity, power and privilege and how to be part of the solution in changing those dynamics. We're designing new programs that explore the experience of indigenous populations across geographic contexts. We're helping support change makers in Southeast Asia and Latin America to start social impact projects with micro grants and capacity building workshops. We're focusing on diversity, equity, and inclusion sessions in a range of regions around the world and adapting them to local dynamics. And we're engaging transatlantic educational and political leaders to promote an inclusive and progressive cultures of remembrance in public spaces in Germany and the United States. And we're doing this all through the tool, the traditional tool that we've always used of international exchange as the vehicle, as opposed to the end result of our work. And as I said earlier, our societies are becoming more polarized by the day and we need to build an army of bridge builders to counterbalance this trend. We're committed to designing programs together with our partners, many of whom are here today, to develop and deploy this army of bridge builders to forge a better future for all of us. Your presence, your financial support, and your friendship today and tomorrow will help us achieve our goals together. Throughout our event today, you'll be invited to consider what contribution you wanna to make to building this community-driven, inclusive, socially active global community. Let me encourage you to say yes to the invitation with a gift to Cultural Vistas as a sign of your commitment. And as an additive incentive, uh, today's sponsors and donors will be entered into a drawing to win the CF Martin Earth Guitar. Details to come, but first, let's get started. We'll start out with our keynote speaker and global visionary, Dr. Parag Khanna, who's joining us, as I said, from Singapore. We'll share some of the major global trends that are shaping our reality today and into the future that he lays out in his new book, Move, The Forces Uprooting Us. Parag was born in India, Grew up in the United Arab Emirates, New York, and Germany, and is now living in Singapore. He's a, low, a leading global strategy advisor, world traveler, and best-selling author, founding uh, and managing partner of Future Map, and a data and scenario-based strategic advisory firm. Prague's newest book, The Move the Forces Uprooting Us, 
was pre uh, preceded by the Futurization, Commerce, Conflict, and Culture in the 21st Century, and he's author, the author of a trilogy of books on the future of the world order. Prague was named uh, as Esquire's 75 most influential people of the 21st century and featured in Wired Magazine's Smart List. He holds a PhD from the London School of Economics, a bachelor's and master's degrees from the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown and has traveled to nearly 150 countries and as a young global leader of the World Economic Forum and that is his short bio. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Prag Khanna. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jennifer. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be joining all of you, uh, albeit virtually. And thank you for tuning in from all corners of the world. Um, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So what I'll do is jump in uh, right away with a short presentation, some of the big ideas that I cover in this book, um, and really looking forward to the discussion with all of you. So let's talk about the war for, for, for talent, and in particular, the war for young talent in the world today. But let's look at it through the perspective of the here and now, the challenges that we face in the global system, in globalization internationally, not just as a result of the pandemic, but actually some of the trends that were evident before the pandemic. Let's remember that we live in a world and have been living in a world characterized by these major driving forces of instability in our human geography. In other words, drivers and motivators that are pushing people to move, to relocate, to pick up and uproot and, and, and find a new place to live, um, sometimes voluntarily, sometimes involuntarily. So the first is demographic imbalances. And that's basically saying that there's a big gap between young and old within our Western societies and labor markets. And that's been true for a long time. That's accounted for migration of workers to Europe and the United States and Canada for decades and decades. And then there's political upheaval, and that could be international conflicts, civil wars, state failure, whatever the case may be. It could be people also uh, taking refuge from or, or running away from governments that they don't like, where they're being persecuted or where there's excessive you know, populism and bad policies. Then there's economic dislocation, which is uh, comes in many forms, but certainly financial crises are one. We'll think about how in the United States, uh, around the time of the uh, global financial crisis, the people, a lot of people moved from the Rust Belt to the Sun Belt. In Europe, it was the opposite direction. It was from Southern Europe to Northern Europe after that crisis. You also have technological disruptions, which cut in multiple ways. People are losing their jobs when a factory is closed or when uh, jobs are outsourced, uh, and therefore they move and looking, looking for new employment somewhere. And that is due primarily to these technological changes. Then think about right now with remote work and, and uh, digitization of services work. So now that could be viewed as a positive thing. You are now allowed by your employer to you know, pack up and you know, move to uh, Costa Rica or to Bali and do your work remotely. So you can have positive technological disruptions that encourage or enable people to move. And then of course there's climate change, uh, which has really become the number one driver in many ways of, uh, of human migration in, in, in major parts of the world. Now, let me say a couple of things here. You can't pick your crisis. You can't focus on labor markets on Monday, political populism on Tuesday, you know, uh, the economic crisis uh, and, and high debt on Wednesday and so on and so forth. All of these issues are really slamming us at the same time and they collide with each other and shape each other in ways that we don't tend to appreciate. And all of that scattering of people and mobility that that encourages is really multiplied by all the connectivity that we've built up in the world that allow people to move and to circulate. And that is why I predict that even though, even despite the lockdown that we've just lived through, we are going to enter an age of unprecedented, accelerated movement and mobility. And again, it may be the most ironic moment to be making this uh, argument, but at the same time, it's also the best moment to start to think about it because coming out of the pandemic, we will be measuring migration and mobility that much more carefully and digitally 
than we ever have before. So the, it's going to be fascinating, actually, to watch the future of migration unfold and see how it's similar or different from the patterns of the past. But let's bear one thing in mind, that the pandemic really was a temporary aberration, if you will. Because if you look at the 17th century, the 18th century, the 19th century, the 20th century, just remember this. The decimal place, of the number of migrants, continues to move to the right. From millions to tens of millions to hundreds of millions, and in this century, surely billions of people who will move due to precisely the reasons that I outline here and more. Now let's look at another kind of, you know, contact, a contextual point. All of this mobility, you may say, well, who? Who are the ones that are moving? Well, that's a demographic question. And the other thing that is so profound about this moment that we live in right now is the world's demographic plateau, the inflection point that we are now at. The moment has arrived. And that moment is what I call peak humanity, which is to say that we are very close to reaching the maximum number of human beings that will ever live in the world. Now, you can be uh, forgiven for not thinking about this every single day, because in the 20th century, we lived in a world of rapid, a rapid increase in the world population. In fact, it quadrupled over the course of the 20th century to 8 billion people. But we are now owing to the fact that actually um, fertility began to decelerate in the 1970s already. And in more recent times, we've had two successive baby bust events, which is to say the financial crisis of 2008 and now COVID. And both of those events in this very short period of time, just over a decade, have led to a pretty serious crash in total global fertility. And that means that rather than a world population that people as recently as the 2000s predicted could reach 12, 13, 14 billion people, will probably not even reach 9 billion people. So hence, we are really at this a peak humanity moment. Now, as such, the whole demographic structure of the world is changing, and it's going to look quite different from what we know from the past. Every previous generation, especially again over the course of the 20th century, if you look at this chart from left to right, each generation has given birth to a larger generation than itself. Now that process is going to stop. And because of this COVID correction that I was just talking about with the most recent baby bust that we're still living through, chances are that Generation Alpha, who are today's babies, and Generation Alpha hasn't yet fully been born, it will complete its cycle in 2025. And you see this dashed line here, it's more or less projecting that given the baby bust that the world is going through right now, which is far more severe than the financial crisis baby bust of uh, 2008, probably Generation Alpha will be smaller than Generation Z. So Generation Z is literally the last or you know, largest uh, generation that the human species will ever produce. But it's still a young world, right? The majority of the human population, as much as we obsess perhaps rightly, about the challenges of an aging world with longer life expectancy, the majority of humankind is young. And what that means, though, is that if young people are, you know, 55, 60% of the world population, but if they are not having children, then something that you could only describe in sci-fi terms is happening, which is that the present is also the future because the present, which is today's youth, are not giving birth to future generations as much. The, so youth today dominate the present and those same youth will dominate the future. So hence the present becomes the future. Again, it's literally not happened before. And we have to take these things into account. Suddenly our demographics are truly finite. So what does this all up, add, add, add up to? You have a world where there's many drivers of migration and so much uncertainty and seeming chaos. And that situation applies in particular, not only to the finite world population that is left, but particularly the young people 
um, who, who dominate global demographics. And so what that means is that the future depends very much on where young people go. And so what I've done in this, in this book is to kind of put youth front and center. They are the protagonists. Um, you know, the four, 4.5 billion young people will determine the winners and losers of the 21st century. As they vote with their feet, we will know what societies are going to thrive because they will have young people coming in and which societies are going to wither because they are not attracting young people, but eventually their older people pass away. And that is what I call the zero sum war for global youth talent. And in a way, despite all the complexity that afflicts the world and, and that we feel we're victims of, um, it, the truth is that it does boil down. The future still does boil down to this simple formula, which is follow the young people and you'll know which countries are going to win. It actually is that simple from a demographic uh, point of view. And so therefore, uh, when I travel, I've been looking you know, to identify what are the places that are, which countries or cities are doing the right thing and attracting young people. Let me just say another thing about the demographics and the, and the fertility issue, because there are countries that are making efforts to turn this demographic contraction around. China, for example, has just uh, you know, obviously ended its one child policy. It's encouraging people to have two children or three children. You know, Russia has tried this. Japan has tried this. France has tried this. Giving out incentives, tax credits, you name it. It doesn't work. It hasn't worked for 20 something years and it's not going to work now because one of the additional motivations or challenges that it's on the mind of young people everywhere besides the economic insecurity that they face is of course climate change. And it turns out if you look at surveys you know, around the world, young people believe that the best way that they can help to you know, reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, you know, is to have one less child, uh, which in many cases means to have no children at all. And that's why we are heading towards this crash. And you can forgive young people for being very concerned about the environment, even if, of course, there are ecologically sustainable ways to raise children, the combination of the economic insecurity and the environmental the consciousness are really weighing down on this. So I don't expect that this trend is going to suddenly reverse itself and the population is going to increase. So now the future hinges on young people. And these young people are the most mobile generation in human history. They're mobile domestically, they're mobile internationally. More young people have passports. Those passports have more access than they've had in generations past. The Cold War is over and many borders have come down. And so young, the, the, the characteristics of the older generation, let's say baby boomers, that prompted them or, or is in the natural course of things, um, you know, sort of encouraged them to be more sedentary were home ownership and having children. And that's the reason people settled down and were, became part of you know, the system, let's say. But if young people today can't afford homes and aren't having children, then maybe they'll be different and their behavior will be different and their values are different and their mo movement will be different. And I use this anecdote that you see here as a good example of that. It wouldn't have occurred to people that during the pandemic, one of the best selling items would be trailer homes and RVs, but that's exactly what happened. And young people immediately jumped, gravitated towards not investing in homes, not sheltering in place, but buying RVs and saying, you know what, this is good enough. This is a home and I'll go and join a mobile commune and community and drive around. And you know, the best part about owning a mobile home is, well, first of all, if there's a hurricane or a storm or an earthquake or a flood, I can just drive away. My home won't be destroyed. And if I lose my job in one place, but I'm looking for jobs somewhere else, so I can just drive to my next job. I don't have to worry about being stuck in one place and having a mortgage on my head. And those are just a couple of examples of the intuitive ways in which young people think today that may not seem normal, 
you know, from the point of view of people who are uh, Gen X or, or baby boomers. But again, we have to view everything through the lens of young people and understand why the, they behave the way they do and why their behavior is quite appropriate to their circumstances. So let's talk globally. Where are young people going? Well, over the past 30 years, we have settled into fairly you know, stable regional patterns of migration. You, or in the case of the Western hemisphere, um, you know, sort of in, in, in this hemisphere. So Latin Americans to North America, people of the former Soviet republics within that zone, Asians within Asia, Africans within Africa, Europeans within Europe. But remember from the perspective of some of these dramatic changes underway, when you think about political unrest and economic crises and climate change, and technological disruption, all of those stirring the pot, probably the future of migration is not going to be as stable and predictable as these patterns that we've settled into. It's going to look different. And again, looking at how the young people on this map, where they move, starting right now after this pandemic, or you know, in the, in the last couple of years and into the future, is going to be the key thing to look for. And again, climate change is going to be a huge driver of that change. If you think about the map of human geography, you would see, as you know, most people in the world, well, most humans live in the Asian, the mega Asian region. Um, and most of the world's population is in developing countries. But if you take this image, this is the IPCC uh, forecast for the, what's called the, the suitability change which is to say the habitability of, um, of a geography as global temperatures rise, one degree, two degrees, you know, and hopefully not beyond that, but it's certainly plausible that it does go beyond that. So the areas in red are becoming less habitable and the areas in green are becoming more habitable. Now note the irony. We just talked about the fertility crash, depopulation in aging, uh, OECD countries, which is to say the United States and Canada, Europe, and the Northeast Asian countries like Japan and Korea. So as you can see, this is the most profound irony. We use the word irony a lot. I do too. But come on, think. can you think of anything more ironic in the, in the world today than the fact that the most livable places that, according to these climate models, are actually becoming more habitable uh, for, for, hum for humans have less and less people, whereas the places that are becoming unlivable due to climate change have the most people and have the most young people. So genuinely, I ask, I say this very seriously, if you care about the future of the human species, the finite number of human beings that exist today and the even fewer number of human beings that exist tomorrow, if you actually care about the future of the species, you really do want to rectify this situation. You really don't want people to simply die in heat waves and droughts in these places that are becoming red. You want people as a natural, gradual process, you want human civilization to come to resort and relocate itself to these habitable places. And of course, to do so as sustainably as possible, not to trample on the pristine environments because we obviously have done a lot of that in the past couple of centuries, but to sustainably resettle the world, again, for the sake of all of us collectively. And that's one of the big questions I ask is, are we going to allow young people to resettle the world in a way that is very different from the patterns of the past? And the answer is, I don't know, but I do know that the answer is not going to come from the United Nations. It's not going to come from the Biden administration. It's not going to come from Beijing. It's something that's going to happen probably more bottom up than top down. And I hope that we can find the, the, uh, the moral leaders among countries and, uh, and, com and companies that can help to stimulate that process in our own collective self-interest. So a couple of points with COP26 starting this weekend, I thought I would, you know, drill down a little bit on this as a sort of primer. You know, COP26 is all about mitigation, and that's extremely important. We do need those Manhattan projects 
for generating renew more renewable power, decarbonizing our industry and supply chains, maybe even these somewhat controversial geoengineering projects to reflect solar radiation. We might need to, we do need to do almost all of these things, if not all of them, in hyperdrive if we're going to reduce uh, the, the pace of uh, temperature rise and, and emissions. But what that does not address and what is not on the agenda at COP26 is adaptation. And adaptation is what we do to survive right now. And while the negotiators are making promises about reducing emissions out to the year 2050, right here in 2021 and in 2020 and over the last 10, 20 years, and certainly for the next 20 years, people are suffering as a result of um, accelerating climate change and all of these other devastating forces as well. So we need to do a lot in terms of adaptation. And that can be infrastructural, it can be policies, it can be new building design, it can be a mobile uh, infrastructure, right? 3D printed housing that you can move around, giving more people trailer homes, whatever the case may be. But here's the one thing that we don't talk about enough. And it's what I have been talking about in the previous slide and right here at the bottom right. And that's move, moving people, that's resettling people. And the interesting thing, and again, irony, is that the one thing that we human beings are the best at, the one thing we've been doing for 150,000 years, uh, and the surest way to save a person's life and to help them adapt to climate change is simply to move them, to help them move, to help them relocate. And we don't talk about it because our negotiations are negotiations among sovereign governments. And the one vestige that is left the most powerful remaining feature of national sovereignty is control over your own borders for the movement of people. Now, today we're not good at you know, uh, using our borders to stop pathogens and viruses, cyber hacks, pollution. But the one thing that even weak countries can more or less still do is to say, you other human beings will not cross this border. So again, the solution is not really going to come through international negotiation. Our governments will agree on reducing emissions. Our governments will even agree on perhaps internet regulation one day. Our governments will agree on how to colonize the moon together, even Mars. Our governments will not agree to a global free movement of people accord. It will not happen. And that's a pessimistic take, but it's a realistic take. And therefore, we have to think about the, the changing attitudes. And that brings me back to the war for talent, right? Because countries are realizing they need young people because we have these demographic imbalances. Countries need young taxpayers and caregivers and construction workers and entrepreneurs and investors, people to pay the rent and buy homes all of those things. And there are countries waking up to this fact, like Canada, like Germany, that are letting in record numbers of migrants and their politics remain stable. Right? Today happened to have been Angela Merkel's very, very last day as chancellor of Germany after a, more than a decade and a half. And look how she pulled off integrating more than a million refugees into the economy, the, the labor force has grown. It's the largest, obviously, and most important economy in Europe. Um, and in the most recent election, it wasn't the far right xenophobic parties that won. It's a left wing sort of, you know, coalition, a leftist and centrist coalition that remains fairly open uh, to immigration. Look at Canada that also just had an election. They let in 400,000 people every single year, similar, almost the same number as the United States but with one tenth the population of the United States. But Justin Trudeau got reelected and there is not a strong anti-immigrant sentiment in Canada. And this is being noticed. You can look at surveys. This is BCG's survey of the most desirable uh, destinations uh, for professionals to work. And indeed, you can see that Canada has you know, nipped ahead uh, of the US uh, for many people. And these rankings may change, but you're starting to see places climb upwards that are really welcoming towards people. Now, look at how the UK, for example, has dropped a couple of notches. 
what they've done in response to that reality that they felt the labor shortages right now, they have a shortage of 100,000 just truck drivers. During the pandemic, they also had a shortage of nurses. You know, there has been a significant excess mortality during the pandemic in America and Britain and elsewhere because we didn't have the right immigration policy. So countries can either learn the hard way or the easy way. The easy way to learn is to say, hey, Canada is doing something right. They're using importing labor and young dynamic you know, workforce to really diversify their economy. Or you could learn the hard way like Britain or like America where you get caught off guard and you have shortages of people and it hurts your own society to not have a good balanced immigration policy. So I think that the war for talent war for young talent is playing out in the Northern hemisphere uh, right on time in some ways, because of course, young people need to get out of the places that they're in. They need to be in places where they're needed and smart countries are taking advantage of that. And what are the ways in which mobility is being encouraged beyond just the demographics? Well, of course, there's the technological change that's underway in the world because the new platforms that are evolving are really enabling greater mobility than we've ever had before. And I'll start with some of the points here, maybe starting at the bottom, actually, you know, look at online education. We've all been young people are doing Zoom school and Zoom learning. It's not optimal, but you can more or less learn from anywhere. And now we have digitization of our health records. Think about your immunity certificates and your QR code now, and you can access those records anywhere in the world and access a healthcare system. So people in the past have been locked into one national healthcare system, but as that data gets shared, you can feel more confident that you can move about and still uh, you know, get, get the medical care you might need. Wi-Fi, car sharing, co-living, co-working, all of these are thriving. Remember, young people are far less likely to own a home or to have children. So they actually view membership in a co-living uh, agreement or membership with you know, WeWork or something like that as something you can just access anywhere. And there are these co-living clubs and it's a lot cheaper to do that than to pay rent in San Francisco uh, or New York for that matter, or to buy a home. And of course, then there's cryptocurrencies and e-wallets. You don't need to go to a bank. You can access your money just about anywhere. And then there's passports as apps. So two things here. First of all, before the pandemic, there was only uh, like one country that had a nomad visa program, and that was e Estonia, right? Today, overnight, we have about 75 countries that have nomad visas that are basically you know, throwing open their doors and saying, come one, come all. We want young people. We want you to come rent Airbnb, come and you know, have Starbucks and you know, eat in our cafes. Just be here and spend money in our economy because we've missed you for the last couple of years. And our economy depends on tourism and hospitality and so forth. So 75 countries in a world that we have you know, characterized wrongly as being dominated by xenophobia and populism and, and, and you know, borders and protectionism. In fact, you know, almost uh, you know, half the countries in the world are saying, no, come one, come all. And even the countries that don't have nomad visa schemes are creating much more friendly tiers uh, for migrants uh, to, to come in and take up residency. And all of this is being digitized. You can get your nomad visa instantly just by applying online. And now that, again, going back to vaccination records, being on a QR code, being digitized, I think that can happen to many other aspects and prerequisites for international migration. Your travel records, your bank statements, your educational history, these kinds of things, you know, are, for better or worse, already online somewhere. And if we can put them on a secure blockchain and you share access to that data as needed upon request in order to gain approval to enter another country that is looking for young people, we can we can massively increase the efficiency in international mobility. And I think that is an idea whose time has come. So it's not only the demographic uh, sort of existential, uh, you know, it's not only the existential issues like demographics and climate change, but technology that's also now going to enable more and more mobility. And, you know, all of these things are coming together at the same time and they represent our salvation.
They represent the best way forward uh, for today's youth to create you know, the thriving civilization of the future. So I'll end with this final point, because what I'm suggesting is that we are in many ways, and especially young people are becoming nomadic again. And I emphasize the word again, because we are a nomadic species like so many other mammals. We have been nomadic for the better part of the last 100,000 years. And that's what this photo represents. Uh, the gentleman on my left in this picture uh, on, on the right side is Paul Salopek. And Paul has been sponsored by National Geographic to walk around the entire world, basically. He actually began about eight years ago in the Rift Valley of uh, Ethiopia. And he is now actually in China. So he's walked about uh, you know, seven or 8,000 miles, but he's got about 16 or 17,000 miles to go. And I've recently joined the board of his uh, Out of Eden project. And I've been using, been supporting and, and, uh, and raising funds uh, through sales of this book for his venture. And I wanted to put this up for a couple of reasons. One, he reminds us of our nomadic origins that we should not be afraid of being more nomadic. We can certainly do it in a much more high-tech, sustainable, resilient way uh, than we have in the past. So not only is that an important, you know, sort of um, uh, insight to remember, uh, but also I believe that because this very special person that he is, is going to be undertaking this journey that, or has been, that no one has ever even attempted, to my knowledge, it's something that I hope that every person is going to watch. Everyone should really track and follow this man. Follow him on Twitter. Follow the hashtag EdenWalk. Lend your support uh, to his mission because you will be so, you know, sort of educated and enlightened by his dispatches that he has been publishing uh, from all, you know, across the world as he's walked across um, the Gulf and South Asia and Central Asia and now into, uh, into East Asia. And, uh, you know, it's sort of a, one of the greatest honors of my life is to now be associated with this venture. And it has been massively inspiring uh, to me uh, as an individual and certainly inspired some of the ideas and content of this book. So with that, let me um, uh, hand it back over and look forward to our conversation. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kana, for that. I'm actually local to Real Vistas. I'm Cherry Atilano. I'm a founding farmer and CEO of Agri in the Philippines. And, uh, you know, we work with 30,000 smallholder farmers in the country. And I found out that you're also a young global leader. So we're in the same community in the World Economic Forum. It's uh -huh. so nice to actually talk to you. I have a question. And I am also an alumni um, impact um, award winner last year. So it's, I'm so happy to be back. I'm signing from the Philippines uh, more than midnight, but it's so good to listen to you. I actually have one question. It's because you know I was so fascinated about the zero sum war for global talent, right? And it seems that the agriculture sector, not a lot of young people globally are interested to that. So, and we're talking about sustainability. So how should we approach sustainability in natural resources and land use in the face of climate change? And what advice would you give to young farmers to develop and you know a land more sustainably and to you know be part of agricultural movement that is sustainable? Thank you. It's a great question, um, and thank you so much, Jerry, for staying up late. And it's a pleasure to 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 uh, to meet you, um, a fellow Asian here in this uh, time zone. Um, so you know, for one thing, you know. The, the geographies of agriculture are really changing. And of course, this is so critical for our survival. You know, we, in recent decades, the largest food producers in the world have been the US and, um, and Brazil, uh, India, China, and Australia. But, you know, this year, Russia is the world's largest wheat producer. And that would not have been possible without climate change. But of course, we also have a lot of volatility. We have droughts afflicting even abundant uh, regions. And one of the things that's really been lacking but is gaining attention because of everything from the pandemic to climate change is the need to support smallhold farmers, to support farmers um, to really maximize their output and to be able to be empowered with the seed technologies and irrigation technologies and the financing that they need to be prepared for shifting elements 
you know, changing weather patterns, climate change, but to still produce the food that's so important uh, for our, you know, uh, large population. So this is, um, you know, I think a very important issue. And increasingly, because of the, the recognition of this, there is definitely more financing going into this area, more trade, more technology, more investment. And, uh, and I think that governments have to absolutely prioritize this. Agricultural banks, you know, represent such a small fraction of the lending in any country. If you look at the Philippines or as from the Philippines to Indonesia to Pakistan, you know, banks lend, you know, um, you know, tons of money to people for credit cards and buying cars and buying homes, but farmers don't get a small fraction, you know, of that, of that lending. But of course, it should be much, much more. So there's technological solutions and there's financial solutions, and we have to embrace all of them. Thank you very much, uh, Farag, you know, for, for that beautiful answer. I'm actually learning a lot from you. Um, I think I cannot get uh, one more question because it's uh, we're running out of time. Um, however, you know your 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 words were so inspirational, and hopefully we can have another session with you. I'm so interested, especially for young people. I think they need to listen a lot to you, and you know, for a young person myself, who's also in the YGL with you, it's such a pleasure. So right now, uh, please join Cultural Vistas to equip the next generation of leaders who can address global challenges in their communities. Together, we can move the world for the better. Your donation to Cultural Vistas today is your chance to win a special edition guitar from CF Martin. Stay tuned for a special performance featuring the guitar at the end. All sponsors as well as donations received today will be entered to win text to give. Thank you so much, Dr. Kana, for your insights. And I'll give it back to the Cultural Vistas team for our awarding. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Kaylin Patterson and I'm a two-time Cultural Vistas program participant. I first began with STEM Launch, a two-week fellowship to Germany focused on encouraging minority STEM students to consider study and work abroad options. Two years later in 2017, I joined as a Congress Bundestag Youth Exchange Fellow where I was able to study, volunteer and work in Germany for a year. Upon my return, I completed my master's degree and began working at the United States Department of Defense as a John S. McCain Strategic Defense Fellow and a Space Systems Engineer. I'm honored to be here today with the Cultural Vistas community to celebrate the 2021 Corporate Leadership Awardee, IBM. IBM has partnered with Cultural Vistas on global talent programs since 2016 creating one of the most diverse programs, hosting interns from more than 25 countries around the world in fields ranging from computer engineering and business to HR and web design. This past year, IBM Germany engaged Cultural Vistas to join the Working Positively Pledge. The Working Positively program is a global initiative that invites employers to commit to being visible role models in their support of HIV positive employees. The Working Positively campaign first launched in Germany in June 2019 and has expanded across the globe. 
joining me today to accept the Corporate Leadership Award on behalf of IBM and to tell us more about their work to build global inclusiveness in the workplace is IBM's Vice President and Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer, Carla Grant Pickens. Carla, congratulations to IBM. Thank you so much, Kaylon, and I'm going to share our award here with the audience. Um, thank you so much for this recognition for IBM to receive the Cultural Vistas Corporate Leadership Award. Um, IBM with our partners SAP and Deutsche Ad Silva first launched in Germany in 2019. We've expanded in Austria, Slovakia, the Czech Republic, and the U.S. Our goal at IBM is to foster a diverse and inclusive environment for IBMers to be their authentic selves. So we are extremely honored to be a recipient of this, of this award. Thank you. Glad to have you here, Carla. Um, so can you tell me more about IBM's Global Talent Program and how you prepare employees for work and life abroad? Absolutely. So we have a myriad of programs to really develop talent from leadership programs and technical and management. But when we are looking to prepare our employees to work and live abroad, we have many, many opportunities for digital learnings that they can take advantage of. These programs are expected to properly prepare our IBMers for their new environment and surroundings. Um, so we have a series of digital self-paced training programs, uh, as well as workshops that IBMers can take to learn about their new destination country they'll be living in. Um, the goal is for them to be able to do adaptability assessments um, to understand the new cultural norms that are expected of them, um, but also to really understand uh, the ways in which uh, they can integrate and live in the country that they're going to be living in. We also offer um, an opportunity for them to continue with additional personal and professional uh, growth experience through learning. Uh, and we ensure that they have both um, a local person that will be kind of their mentor buddy to help them um, in their assimilation in the company, as well as keeping them connected with their professional coach leader uh, from their home country. So this is this a real opportunity um, for us to also ensure that, that they are able to work with um, a coach through our destination services vendors, that will also help them in their personal life. So if they come with a partner or spouse or with a family member or, or, or additional family members or children for that matter, that preparation is done holistically with the family, with the employee, um, really thinking about their, their ent entire life um, experience with their families as well. That's good to hear. I know that was an important part of CBYX um, in, when we were in Germany, just having those constant touch points with the um, with the facilitators, letting them know what we're going through and just having someone to vent to. So I think that's very important. Um, living in Germany for a year was a life changing and career building experience for me personally. Uh, can you share your own experience of living and working abroad? Oh, absolutely. I hear Germany is amazing. So that's great. I'm so glad you had that experience. And for me, um, my experience really came mid-career. I lived in Asia, um, in Manila, um, Philippines, for a little over three years. And this um, opportunity was for me to really um, lead talent strategy across several uh, countries, the ASEAN countries, uh, and well, as well as um, lead um, in a role as the HR country leadership. We had several locations across many of the Philippine islands in, in locations. This was most impactful um, for me from an ex uh, experience uh, perspective, uh, both from a professional and personal life experience and for my family. Uh, we by far uh, talk about the experience a lot. It's actually going to be 10 years next year um, since we actually arrived in the Philippines and we've actually been home about six and a half years. 
And this opportunity really provided me with um, a perspective of looking at culture through the eyes of others. So really having that global lens. Um, it was also great to be able to experience and understand various points of view um, and to really um, understand different cultural norms um, that required me to work uh, and adapt differently. Uh, also, it was a great opportunity for me to learn how to really align and be flexible about how adopting different programs or maybe policies um, may be received differently or we, or we would have to work differently um, in different countries for things that we were really uh, pushing out from a corporate perspective uh, to really be able to effectively work in a local uh, lives perspective. So my Philippines experience was just wonderful. Um, the people made it the best. Um, I think the most kind people I've ever encountered, but they made me feel like the Philippines was my home. So it did become my second home. And I had such a great experience. It's just priceless. Um, I miss the food. Um, they fed me all day, every day. <laughs> so um, I have incorporated like lumpia and passit and um, chicken adobo into our family meals. So we, we continue to, to look and search out for Filipino style restaurants um, all across the States. So Yummy, 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 yummy food. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Um, so working positively has inspired many companies to join the program. Uh, can you tell me how IBM is expanding its reach and what employers can do to join the initiative? Yeah, so today we have nearly 250 employers who've signed the pledge to join the program. Uh, we've rolled it out, um, the project in Austria, the U.S. and Germany. So um, those worldwide signers uh, really are helping us support this mission. Um, in December, we'll, we will um, roll out in Switzerland and the uh, Czech Republic will follow. Um, we have some big, big uh, events planned for World, World AIDS Day in 2021 in Austria. Um, where we will welcome additional partners and signers um, at an external event as well uh, in Latin America. Uh, so we're going to get our first signers uh, as well in that continent. Uh, in 2022, we plan to begin uh, with an external event in the Netherlands. Further, we have initiated the rollout in Italy, the UK, Denmark, Spain, Australia, New Zealand, where we have done a lot of internal SAP and IBM information uh, sessions, um, and where we're really beginning to collaborate locally with um, IBM and SAP uh, employees and teams and NGOs to implement hashtag WP. So um, similar to IBM, SAP has signed um, with, um, signed not only in the US, Austria and Germany, but also um, they are a great partner in various countries where we are developing the hashtag WP right now. So together uh, we are doing information sessions, a lot of external events, attracting customers, attracting companies to sign our pledge. IBM and SAP are working side by side to attract companies more and more to get involved. So, and we are also mo more so focused as well on a rollout to come in Asia. So at this point, we've reached nearly 9,000 IBMers directly. Um, and as an employer looking to get involved, you can visit Working Positively website and reach out to our very own Axel uh, Wettler, who you're gonna hear from in a minute, um, to get um, um, involved and to get more information that's listed there. Um, so, Kaylon, what I'm thinking is I'd love to turn it over to my colleague, Axel, who is a driving force behind Working Positively, um, our program here at IBM. I'd love for him to share what this program has done for, for him as an employee. Axel, over to you. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Kaylon, for your inspiring words. My name is Axel. I'm working for IBM in Germany and I'm HIV positive. No reason for me to be desperate or sad, but one more reason to fight stigma and discrimination everywhere, anywhere. 
And I must tell you, I am so happy that I came out with my HIV disease just 15 years ago. I was hiding it four years within IBM because everybody was telling me outside, doctors, friends, other employers, don't tell that because you will be maybe fired and people will not understand that you are working with this disease. This is why it was at that time a very popular one, but it was wrong because hiding something on your shoulders means a big burden. And when I came out to IBM, the reaction of my company was fantastic. They've supported me from the very first moment in the best way. And this was for me, my own promise that I have to support my company fighting against stigma and stigmatization. In 2018, just four employees of IBM sat together and thought maybe we can find a declaration or a pledge against stigma and discrimination of people with HIV at the workplace. And we thought maybe we can convince our management here in Germany, maybe some other companies, but we never thought it could be a roll out globally. So I'm so much personally touched emotionally by now the situation that IBM together with SAP and local NGOs like Deutsche Aids Civil have created a program which shows employers can give a clear signal that within their in companies, everyone can be safe. They have a safe workspace where everybody can be out with everything he wants. He will not be forced, but he can be. And so I'm very proud what I heard today from Carla and also from our friends from Cultural Wisters. And my just, my last sentence is please join our initiative. Become a strong partner of what we call working positively and we make our world a small step better and we can continue to make people feel safe wherever they live and work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Axel, for sharing. And thank you, Carla, for joining us. Congratulations again to IBM on your award and for inspiring us all with a vision of what the future of, glo of the global workspace can be. Join Cultural Vistas in building a global community that is inclusive and equitable for all. Donate to our mission and support programs that expand global leadership, leverage technology to increase access, and invest in our alumni to build a stronger, more vibrant civil society across the globe. Um, please text to donate, Vilan Dank. Thank you, Kaylan, and thank you, Axel, and Salamat for my friends in the Philippines. Thank you also from my side, ein herzliches Danke aus Deutschland, and I'm looking forward to work together with all of you. Hello, buenas tardes, bonjour. Thank you all for being here. Please know that we're running about 10 to 15 minutes late, but please do stick around to the end to hear about the amazing work that our alumni awardees are doing. My name is Mariana Martinez and my pronouns are she, her, hers. As alumni council co-chair, I'm honored to be here with you today. Our annual alumni awards give us the chance to come together to honor and celebrate two individuals who are visionaries on the front lines of global community building. There are so many Cultura Vistas alumni who are working to make the world a better place. It is becoming harder and harder every year to just choose two. This year's awardees are truly inspirational. Dwayne Galovacki is a two-time international award-winning sustainability manager from Fiji. He was a keynote speaker at the 2019 Young Pacific Leaders Conference in Suva, Fiji, 
and went on to participate in the International Visitors Leadership Program that same year. Through this experience, Dwayne made connections to strengthen collaboration on sustainability projects throughout the Pacific region, including supporting indigenous stewardship of islands and ocean management, as well as empowering communities to find resilient solutions. He is currently managing a project to deliver 60,000 efficient cookstoves across Fiji to improve the health and sustainability to those who feed their communities. Dwayne, congratulations on receiving this year's Alumni Impact Award. Thank you very much. Um, and a very good morning and a good evening to everyone um, from wherever in the world that you're tuning in from. Um, I'm personally very delighted to accept this award on behalf of so many people that are involved in doing incredible work in communities around the region and around the world. And I'm happy to join in with the rest of the alumni network, wherever you may be in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Duane, and congratulations again. <clears throat> now, I have the honor of introducing this year's Distinguished Alumni Leadership Award winner. I've personally gotten to work with Cordell as a fellow Cultural Vistas Alumni Council member. An alumnus of the Robert Bosch Foundation Fellowship to Germany, Cordell has always been engaged in both alumni mentorship and finding opportunities to promote global leadership to the next generation. In fact, U.S. President Biden named Cordell to the White House Commission on Fellowships. As Executive Director of the Socrates Program at the Aspen Institute, Cordell is leading some of the most important discussions of our time, from inclusive leadership to racial justice and beyond. He's currently joining us from Austin, Texas, where he's premiering his documentary, The Road Trip to Belonging. Thank you, Cordell, for being with us today, and congratulations to you. Thank you so much, Mariana, and thank you to the entire Cultural Vistas community. It is uh, a pleasure to be honored, and uh, I must show this amazing award because it was flown to me here on location in Aspen. There, there are two terms that I've learned through my fellowship experiences, the first being the Bosch Fellowship uh, 13 years ago, and that's Lebenslauf, which is uh, the run of one's life. This is the word for our for resume, and then uh, more recently, five years ago, as an Eisenhower Fellow to China, and that was Zhejiang, which is my very horrible Mandarin that says learn by travel. And when I think about the career propelling events for this first generation college student, first in a family to travel without a military orders to do so, um, the things that have propelled me in my life, that have shaped the way I, I think, that have transformed me as a human being, have been these amazing experiences afforded by organizations just like Cultural Vistas. And so I, I am beyond honored. Moreover, I'm, I'm indebted to this organization. I'm indebted uh, to other folks just like me, those first generation kids that just wanna make something out of nothing, that wanna change the course of their lives, that wanna see the world. Um, they spin globes and dream about going to those places. I've been able to do it, I'm doing it right now as a result of these experiences that I had. Um, as a Bosch Fellow, as an Eisenhower Fellow, and, and a few other things that I'm doing. Uh, the fellowship experience is this person-to-person -person contact is actually more relevant here in the United States than it's ever been. I'm on a new uh, track here at the Aspen Institute uh, on belonging, this idea of, of giving our country beyond our current state of debate about diversity, equity, inclusion to the destination we're trying to achieve. And, and that is a society where everyone belongs and everyone thrives. And it's been incredible. Uh, we're on a road trip to belonging, a documentary that's gonna be released uh, next month. Uh, traveling all over the world again, uh, focus grouping these, uh, this documentary. Uh, the first stop is Berlin. I need some currywurst and I need some really good beer. And I wanna relive that Bosch experience from many years ago. So thank you again. Um, and I ask that you all join me. Today I'm pledging $1,000 to Cultural Vistas uh, as a gift and my challenge to my colleagues in the Bosch Fellowship, the Bosch alums, if you all will donate $10,000 as aggregate before the end of the week, I will donate another $1,000 for a total of 2,000. Um, that's how much I believe in the power of this program and our need and our obligation 
to extend it to others. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Cordell, and congratulations again. Our alumni are doing amazing things around the world that strengthen democracy, build mutual understanding, create more sustainable pathways, and promote peace and prosperity more equitably. We look to build a global hub for all of us to connect with each other, to share knowledge, perspectives, and to take action to address the global challenges we face. As your Alumni Council co-chair, I hear this call. With your help, alumni like Cordell, Duane, and so many more can come together to strengthen our global network and lead the way. So please text to give to Culture of Vistas today. concludes our program today. I want to thank you all for being here to celebrate with us. I want to congratulate our awardees for being truly visionaries on the front lines of global community building. Thank you, Parag, for sharing your wisdom with us. And thank you to all of our sponsors for their financial support, which keeps growing, uh, which allows us to take a leading role in making a difference worldwide. Today, as we mentioned before, we have a challenge for all of you and all Vistans around the globe with a special incentive C.F. Martin makes the world's most beautiful guitars played by iconic musicians and beginners alike. I wanna share a quote from Chris Martin, CEO of C.F. Martin Guitars. There's so much that we can do as individuals to fight climate change in our daily lives, not just on Earth Day, but every day. Music has always been a powerful tool for bringing people together for change. I'm so excited to announce that this guitar will be the prize in our end of year campaign, starting with any donation received today and through Giving Tuesday on November 30th. Your gift to Cultural Vistas is your chance to win. Here to play that guitar with us today and showcase its beauty is C.F. Martin Ambassador Craig Thatcher, who wrote this piece especially for our benefit, entitled Every Day is Earth Day Rag. <laughs> ¶¶ 